So, as you probably gathered if you've been around here for a little while, I grew up in the church. My parents had us at church pretty much every time the doors were open, uh, especially for things like uh, kids' activities and youth group stuff. But also, from a very young age, they wanted me to sit in the worship service with them on Sunday mornings. Which I would like to tell you, as somebody who is now in the ministry and now part of the Sunday morning worship service, was something that I loved. I would like to tell you that some of my very fondest memories from my childhood came from those times sitting with my parents in the pews listening to the sermon. But folks, the truth is, I spent almost the entire hour and a half every week worried that I might actually die of boredom before we could get out of that room. And so one of the most important moments of the sermon or of the service in general for me was that moment when the pastor would climb up into the pulpit and straighten his tie, and take a deep breath, and deliver those first few lines of the sermon. And that was important because the sermon was the longest unbroken section in the entire service. It was the one that my parents really cracked down on me on and wouldn't let me go and weasel my way out to the back room where my more delinquent friends got to hang out. I I just had to sit there and endure it. And in those first few minutes... They were important because I could tell pretty quickly if this was going to be the sort of sermon that could get me through to lunchtime or if I was going to have to amuse myself by rereading the parts of Revelation that have dragons and blood in them, Uh, which nobody wanted to preach from growing up. I would have been much more attentive. But sometimes it took me a few minutes to decide if this was going to be one of those sermons that I could listen to or not. I mean, sometimes he was just a little bit slow to get going, or he's a little bit cagey at the beginning, and, you know, you don't want to make a snap decision, right? Because if you hang on for a few minutes, it's possible that this thing could become not only listenable, but actually really good. That happens. Sometimes if you wait just a few minutes, well, you know, you're all sitting in the room trying to make that decision for yourself right now. But there were a few things that he could say, or really that any preacher could say, that would cause me to shut down almost instantly in those first few seconds. One of the worst offenders that came up the most often was the other day when I was golfing. I don't care about what happened to you when you were golfing. And if this sermon does not have 100% more dragons than it has right now in the next few minutes, I am gone. (laughs) But the one that got me probably more times than any other line at the beginning of the sermon was in his letter to the blank churches, the Apostle Paul writes, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) I didn't like Paul. (laughs) Which I know sounds bad, right? Because if you tune out Paul, you are tuning out a lot of, you know, the Bible. Uh, (laughs) But it's still true. And actually, cards on the table here, folks, I still have a hard time appreciating Paul as much as I appreciate the other parts of Scripture. And I would feel worse about saying that to you, except that unless I'm really misreading the room when I stand up here and I preach a sermon from one of these Pauline letters versus uh, something from the Gospels or one of the parts of the Old Testament that deserves a heavy metal soundtrack, for instance, (laughs) I'm not the only person here that feels that way. I can see you up here. Uh, there's a little bit of extra brow furrowing that happens for most of us when we try to make sense of what Paul is trying to say in most of these letters. And if that's the case for you, then the idea of this series that Aaron kicked off for us last week might sound like the sort of thing that wants you, that might make you want to just mentally check out. Because for the next few weeks, we're going to be working our way through Paul's letter to the Philippians together, overhearing what Paul has to say to a young church struggling in an empire that isn't compatible with the message that they've embraced from Jesus, and trying to think together about what that might have to say to those of us who are on a similar journey, even though we're not under imperial rule 2,000 years later. And so Aaron started off this series last week uh, by talking about the poem or the hymn in chapter 2 that forms the heart of this letter, the bit that we're going to be reciting together and memorizing together throughout the, the course of this series over the summer where Paul tells the church at Philippi, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, the one who didn't regard the fact that he was God in the flesh as something to be exploited, which he could have very easily done, but who instead emptied himself and humbled himself, becoming a servant to the very beings that he had created, even to the point of dying on a Roman cross. 
And for Paul, it's that willingness to empty himself of power, to serve instead of to dominate, to die instead of retaliate, that makes Jesus not just a really nice guy that all of us should appreciate, but the Lord, the one that owes, that deserves our our pledge of allegiance more than any flag or power or ruler that might be demanding our loyalty explicitly or implicitly. Jesus is the one for Paul that we are to submit everything in our life to. And it's important to know that going into this letter, I think, because if you find it hard to appreciate Paul because he feels a little bit dry or uninteresting compared to some of the passages from the Gospels or the more dragony parts of Revelation, for instance, remembering that Paul is writing here with an agenda, that he is, in a sense, stoking a rebellion against violence and self-interest that has defined what it means to be powerful at all for as long as anybody can remember, that can, I think, start to pump a little bit of blood into the experience of reading this letter, especially the parts that feel otherwise a little bit like reading somebody else's mail. And the very beginning of this letter, which we're going to look at this morning, is a pretty good example of one of those kinds of passages, I think. If we're not reading it with that vision of who Jesus is for Paul in our heads, then this first little section feels like a flowery thank you note to a bunch of people that we've never met and never will meet. Now that said, even if that's all it was, it would still be a nice change of pace compared to most of Paul's other letters, right? Because let's be honest, folks, another reason that a lot of us have trouble with Paul is that for modern readers, a lot of the time, Paul comes across like a really self-important grump. And there's some really good reasons for that that are best saved for other sermons where we will further unpack my childhood together instead of me just paying for the therapy that I need. But even with those reasons in mind, that tone gets very old for us pretty quickly, I think. But it's immediately apparent when we start reading this particular letter to the Philippians that things are a little bit different here. He doesn't move from a quick greeting into a stern reminder of his authority as an apostle of Jesus or into the kind of backhanded compliments that give us that sense that he is barely holding back his frustration like he does in so many of his other letters. Instead, Paul greets the Christians in the church at Philippi and thanks them. And instead of just moving on to whatever the bigger point is he's trying to make, he just sits there in his gratitude for them for just a little bit longer. And we get the sense as we sit with him that this isn't a normal thank you note for Paul. That when he says that they have shared with him in the gospel from the first days until now, that they hold him in their heart, and he remembers them always in their prayers, that he believes that the good work that God has started among them he will bring to completion by the day of Christ Jesus, that when they enter his thoughts, he is filled with compassion for them. When we hear those things, we realize he's, he's probably not just being nice here. These people are important to Paul. And not just important to Paul in the sense that he likes them and has a relationship with them, but they are important to him for where he is right now and maybe where they are right now. We get a sense from what he's saying here that this is about more than saying thank you, that there's almost a note of consolation in his tone for them and for whatever they happen to be going through that we aren't seeing directly and for whatever situation Paul finds himself in when he writes this letter. And if you feel that a little bit when we read these verses, that isn't a coincidence because based on what we can tell from this part of the letter here and from other parts, things aren't going that well in the church at Philippi and not for the usual reasons that we find in letters like the one to the church at Corinth. The reasons aren't totally clear here. But even if we don't know for sure, it's not hard to imagine a couple of things that could be going wrong for them. For one thing, the entire church at this point is in the process of very slowly being pulled away from the larger community that it grew out of, the Jewish community. For a lot of Jewish believers, they thought of themselves as Jews who followed Jesus. That was just the next step in their, in their Jewish belief. But over time, the more they focused on Jesus as God become flesh, the more they welcomed in non-Jewish believers, the more this group began to grow into a distinct body of believers the more they began to be called Christians instead of Jews. And that might sound like an academic or a theological problem until you realize that when those communities start to pull apart, 
What's also being par- pulled apart are the relationships that exist there. The relationships that you've had with your family and friends that you grew up in this community with. Relationships that are now being strained as we try to decide if you are one of us anymore or not. And that was a painful process for many in the church. And that was starting around this time, or I guess I should say picking up steam around this time. And so Paul may have that in mind when he's writing to them. And on top of all that, these believers are living in a Roman colony, a place where soldiers would retire after a long career in service to their emperor. And they're living there as people who believe and proclaim that Jesus and not the emperor or the Roman Empire or any other ruler in the world is the one worthy of our worship and allegiance and service and sacrifice. Which is the sort of thing that probably didn't go over too well in a community full of Roman military veterans, right? And so behind Paul's words here is probably more than a thank you. It's a recognition that these are people who are in the process of losing things that most of us would take for granted. Relationships and routines and social standing and maybe even their physical safety, at least if not now, maybe a little bit further down the road. None of those things, the things that keep us feeling anchored and secure without us even really thinking about it, are sure or stable for these folks anymore because of their membership in the body of Christ, because of the fact that they have decided to follow Jesus. And so Paul writes to them to console them for what they are going through. And at the same time, Paul's future is just as uncertain because the thing is, He's not writing this letter in a dimly lit office surrounded by stacks of dusty old books. That might be the way we tend to imagine him when we're in the thick of one of his run-on sentences, but something different is happening here for Paul. He's in prison. And being thrown in prison would be a terrifying prospect for any of us, right? I don't want to make light of our our prisons and the the situation that that the prisoners find themselves in now. Uh, Where I grew up, people tended to talk about the local prison as if it was a country club because if you went there at least you knew you got three meals and a place to sleep right but the thing is if you ask those same people if they wanted to be in prison if that would make their life any easier I guarantee you they would tell you no across the board and they would do that because we know even though your physical needs are being met in a place like that prisons are places that are designed to make you feel isolated from the people that you love and unsafe around the people that you're with. But as bad as prison is now, it was worse in the Roman world, and it was considerably different. And so if we want to imagine Paul's current situation as he's writing this letter, we need to imagine not the Washington County Jail, but we need to imagine ourselves in more of a cave than a room, a place without an overhead light, or a bed, or a toilet, or even one of those little slots in the cell door that you see in movies where guards would slide through a little plate of gruel or mystery meat or something to the prisoners. They don't have those little slots in the cell doors because much of the time in the Roman world, they didn't bring you food. If you wanted to be fed, you had to rely on friends and family who near, lived nearby to come and bring you the sustenance you needed, or else you just didn't eat. Imagine sitting in that place then, And knowing that those basic amenities aren't here for you because there is no such thing as a long prison sentence in the Roman world. That you are meant to sit here, quiet, filthy, and alone, until you either starve to death or you are brought up long enough to be pushed off the nearest cliff or nailed to the bars of a Roman cross. Justice was a dark thing in the Roman Empire. And Paul finds himself in a dark place as he writes this letter to people who are also in a dark place. And in that place, the words that we find at the beginning of this letter suddenly take on a very different tone, don't they? They sound a lot less like Paul, the biblical writer who makes dry theological arguments, and a lot more like a man who aches to be with his friends again. A man who is leaning on the memories that he spent times with them in this church at Philippi that is a way of keeping himself going. Their faithfulness to him in his situation and to the gospel in their own persecution, that isn't just a nice, benign abstraction for Paul. It is a way of remembering what's important. It's a way of clinging to hope in a place where there seems to be none 
and to remember and to pray for his friends who seem to be in the same situation. If you're unsure about spending the next few weeks in this letter, it might help, I think, to come at it not expecting a series of admonishments and theological treatises like we might have come to expect from Paul from our experience with other letters, but instead to come here looking at Paul as he remembers his days with this church as he struggles to keep going, to to hear his words to people who are struggling themselves, and to see in that a picture of what the church can be when we let the same mind be in us that is in Christ Jesus. Word church can dredge up a lot of feelings or memories depending on what your encounter with it has been. For a lot of people, it's a place of worship and peace and sanctuary, even if you did spend a lot of your childhood wondering how you're going to make it through the worship service. But for a lot of other people, it is something else entirely. It's a community stained by bigotry and abuse, and at the very least, a community that is an accomplice to those evils because of all the times that we have been silent when we should have spoken up, and the times when we should have been silent, or at least a little bit kinder, when we spoke up too loudly and too often. And even if that's not what the church is for you, or if you've been part of it for a while and it's an important part of your life, church can still feel a lot of the times like it is irrelevant, out of touch, a place that's harder to break in and find community than it should be, a place where we can't be as honest with one another as we feel like we want to be. Or even, and this goes for people in ministry as well, it often feels like a thing that is just more trouble than it's worth. And the truth that hasn't always been owned well by those of us in the church is that the church has been many of these things for many different people throughout its time here on earth. And it has felt like all of these things to some of us at some point in our lives. We have much to celebrate as the community of God, but we also have much that needs to be forgiven. We have inherited and perpetuated a story about what it looks like to be followers of Jesus, that is complicated. Whatever your memories or impressions of the church might be, letters like this one remind us that we can be, we are called to be, more than all of those things. The church at its best can be not just a nice place to get together with people that you like, but a lived expression of that same kind of self-emptying humility and service that Christ himself modeled for us and his willingness not only to love us and to heal us through our own pain and weakness and loss, but also through his own. A community of people that gives us that strength to cling to life when we find ourselves in places that are as dark and isolated and hopeless as a Roman prison. And at the same time, one that keeps us pointing beyond ourselves to show the love and care of Jesus to people who find themselves in dark places of their own as Paul was doing for the church at Philippi. What this part of the letter reminds us of is that the church can be more, that we are called to be more than what we have imagined or assumed or experienced the church to be. It's not a coincidence that Paul remembers his friends at Philippi with such gratitude and compassion and yet still holds up God's humility and service in Jesus as the goal for their life together, as if it's one they haven't quite reached just yet. Committing ourselves to imitating his self-emptying love has something to say to all of us, no matter where we find ourselves in relationship to the larger body of Christ right now. And so if things are dark for you right now, or if the word church dredges up memories of past darkness or your current frustrations with what the body of Christ looks like, Paul reminds you that God does not leave dead and broken things dead and broken. Like Jesus himself, those things can still be redeemed and resurrected, whether it's a part of your own life that needs that redeeming or some part of the church where we haven't been all that we have been called to be. Hope and life are still possible no matter what you have been or are going through. I have seen that in my own life, which is something we can talk about a little bit more sometime, and have seen it over and over and over again in the lives of people here who have gone through things that are far worse than I could possibly imagine, and yet who still manage to look beyond their current situation and point us back to God. If things are good for you now, and you just 
can't imagine how people could think of the church and, and, and imagine all of these things that we've been talking about. If this has been a safe place for you, a community of hope, please understand it just hasn't been that for everybody. That a lot of folks have very good reasons to be suspicious and angry of who we are and what we do here. That it's possible to be here every week and to still feel absolutely alone. And that the story that you are a part of is just a little bit more complicated than your own experience with it. If you're in that good place, make it your mission to cultivate compassion for those folks, to pray for them, to invite them over for dinner, to sit with them in silence if that's what they need. And often that is what they need. You can be a vehicle for God's love and hope for people who are in that place, even if you feel inadequate to do so. And often it's those very simple things that make the biggest difference. I have to imagine that when Paul was sitting in the Roman prison, thinking about his friends at Philippi, he wasn't thinking about those moments that were the big church reshaping kind of moments that he experienced with them. He was remembering the meals they shared together. The time when they spoke a word of kindness to him when he was feeling discouraged. The time when they gave him a, whatever the ancient equivalent of a high five is after he had done well. The church can be more. The church is called to be more than we have imagined or assumed or experienced the church can be. So what is your next step to making that calling on the church a reality in your own little sphere of influence? Who have you encountered? Who will you encounter next who needs to experience what the church has called to be and not just what it is when it's at its worst? As you work through that for yourself and you listen to how God's Holy Spirit might be leading you to work this out, I think it might be helpful for us to read together that Christ hymn that we're memorizing this summer from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Uh, not only because it's the heartbeat of this particular letter, but because one of the first steps to imagining what this might look like in our own life now is to remember what it looked like when Jesus was with us. And so we're going to end this service by doing something a little bit different. We are going to read together the, the, the words from that passage in Philippians, which we'll put on the screen. He said, hopefully, there they are. And when we, are, when we are done with this, I will close us out in prayer. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord the glory of God the Father. Will you pray with me, please?